Good evening, everyone. We are at Mill Hill Synagogue this evening. Welcome to Mill Hill Synagogue's Hustings evening. And we are, of course, in exciting times in our countdown to Election Day in just over a week's time. With near 400 people in this room, and considering how the last election was won by a mere 106 votes, the decision for our local MP could, to all intent and purposes, be decided in this room here tonight. So first, a necessary disclaimer. For those of you wondering as to my tie color, it is not my obvious preference, but we as a community, as a synagogue body, must and of course do remain impartial. Voting is everyone's individual personal right and choice and thus reflecting in all the ties in my closet, it is the only one that is not blue, red, yellow, purple, gold, green, or orange. Before we begin, and before I introduce my candidates, there's something we do need to do because we're going to do this again at the end to determine some effectiveness of this evening. And I'd like to ask for a show of hands, simply for how many of you in the first instance might be already fixed in your voting preference. And then I'll do the same for asking for floating. Thank you, okay, you can put those hands down. Now can I ask for a show of hands for all those that may be still floating in their voting preference? It's a start. Okay, so let me now immediately begin by introducing our candidates, and I'll be very brief. Andrew Dismore joined the Labour Party in 1974. He began his professional career as a partner with Robin Thompson and Partner Solicitors in 1978. He became a partner in Russell Jones and Walker Solicitors in 1995. He was elected as a councillor on Westminster City Council in 1982, becoming the Labour Group leader in 1990 and elected to the House of Commons in the 1997 general election for the new seat then of Hendon. He became a member of the Social Security Select Committee in 98, which was later his replacement to the Work and Pensions Select Committee, on which he remained until 2005, a member of the Standards and Privileges Select Committee, as well as the Human Rights and Liaison Committees. Andrew Dismore asked Tony Blair a parliamentary question about Holocaust Memorial and Education and received a written answer on the 10th of June 99, which led to the establishment of Holocaust Memorial Day in the UK. He also set the 21st century record for a filibuster in the House of Commons by talking for 197 minutes during a particular debate, but we're not going to let that happen tonight. More recently, he was selected as the Labour Party candidate for the Barnet and Camden constituency in the 2012 London Assembly election. Thank you, Andrew, for joining with us here this evening. <laughs> Matthew Wofford worked at the BBC as a political analyst at Television Centre. An elected fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, he is a keen sailor and scuba diver. Matthew became involved with the Conservative Party whilst at university in Nottingham in the early 90s, working his way up the voluntary side of the party until he became chairman of the Hendon Conservative Association in 2004. In addition to that, he's also worked as an agent for the party in numerous campaigns and seats. Matthew has been a councillor in Hendon since 2002, and in addition to being deputy leader of Barnet Council, he is also the cabinet member for Environment and Transport, Cabinet Member for Investment in Learning and Cabinet Member for Community Safety and Community Engagement. In July 2007, Matthew was selected by an open primary system when almost 300 people from Hendon chose him on a shortlist, and he won the seat of Hendon at the 2010 election, serving as MP until present day. In 2013, Matthew Offord claimed there is a clear trend of attacking religion at the moment, as he proposed an amendment to the Local Government Act to allow prayers to take place at council meetings. Thank you, Mather, Matthew, for joining with us this evening. <laughs> Alistair Hill joins us from the Liberal Democrats. He is a secondary school biology teacher. He studied tropical environmental science at the University of Aberdeen, where, among other things, he represented the university in curling competitions. After a stint working as a nurse assistant, he took up postgraduate study at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He graduated from Goldsmiths College in 2012 and has been teaching in a state co-educational school in North London ever since. He follows European culture and politics 
is an obsessive recycler and something of an amateur cook. Alistair also stood as candidate for Millhill Ward in the Barnet local elections of 2014 for the Lib Dems and is a member of the Mill Hill Residents Association and the Mill Hill Neighborhood Forum. And we thank you very much for joining with us here this evening. <laughs> Raymond Shamash is a senior oral surgeon at the NHS who, as UKIP representative says, he is passionate about the National Health Service. He was a Leeds University graduate where he was the Student Union's anti-apartheid secretary. He also lived in Israel for 30 years where amongst other things, he served as a medical officer during the Yom Kippur War and later went on to work in Haifa's Rambam Hospital. Though not having served in a political capacity, he maintains that he is especially fearful for the future of Anglo Jury and wants to change things so that he can better safeguard the community. And we thank you, Raymond, for coming along this evening. And last, but certainly not least, Ben Samuel at my far left is standing as member of the Green Party. He studied chemistry at the University of Nottingham, is looking to build a safer world for future generations. Ben combines gardening with activism, and his big victories include helping elect the UKIP's first Green MP. Sorry, I beg your pardon, the UK's first Green MP. <laughs> He campaigned with Camden's leading feminist, Natalie Bennett, launching some shiny new electric vans at the bread factory and runs a small business, Hendon Gardening, through which he hopes to create skilled jobs. Ben, thank you for joining us here tonight. And so we begin. Gentlemen, I've, of course, avoided any particular mention of specific political stances that you might hold, because that is where you are going to come in. I'm going to ask you each to take no more than three minutes in the first instance to put forward your message, essentially what you represent politically. And at the end of your three minutes, you will hear a bell by the lovely Mrs. Jackson that sounds like this. I feel like a game show, right? At which point you can finish your sentence, but that's it. And in the spirit of fairness, for the benefit of the audience here, we did draw lots earlier to determine the order in which you will present and I will invite you, therefore, to speak in that particular order. So I will invite, in the first instance, our incumbent MP, Matthew Offord, to spend his three minutes telling us all that he represents. Thank you, Rabbi. In 2010, we inherited a terrible, difficult situation in our finances of this country. I paid tribute to Nick Clegg, who decided to put the interests of the country before his party, and he joined in a coalition that uh, came about. Now, not only people say to me they don't like the coalition, I can certainly agree with that, but it was the right thing to do at the time. One of the things we said that we wouldn't do would be to cut spending on the NHS, and I'm very proud that we haven't done that. We've been invested a record £113 billion. Pounds. That's 20 million more operations than are happening in 2010, and 2,000 people a day are being treated at A&E more than they were in 2010. But we have made difficult decisions, there's no doubt about that. But certainly, focusing upon our good record in this constituency, where we've seen unemployment fallen by half, we've seen 52,000 people being taken out of the tax bracket, so they keep more of their own money, and we're looking to go further with taxable allowances, both increasing it from 10,500 to 12,500, and to increase the 40p rate up to 50,000 pounds, that would stop a lot of people in the public service being collared by the higher rate of tax. But we've got a lot more to do. Yesterday's economic figures showed that we cannot be complacent with the economy and it could certainly go back again. And the issue in this election is whether we put that all at risk by voting an SNP Labour coalition or we go back to the Conservative Party to finish a job that we started. In Hendon, we've had many successes. I'm very proud of the fact that at my first question in Parliament was about school security and Michael Gove came forward with £2 million to keep our children safe in the schools. Most recently, I have uh, argued and questioned the Prime Minister and others to increase that. And at the CST dinner recently, I was very pleased when he mentioned myself and Mike Freer and announced that he was going to give the community £11.5 million to keep schools, both independent and public sector, uh, and synagogues and Jewish cultural centres safe. And I'm very proud of that. We still have a lot more to do. I'm not complacent about crime. 
We do have fewer police officers, and they've taken the necessary cuts that they had to. But I'm very pleased that the police rose to the challenge, and crime is down 14% in this area. We've asked the police to do more with less, and they have done that. But there are many other areas that we want to continue to work in. The rabbi didn't mention I'm a member of the Environmental Audit Select Committee. It's the environment that's a particular passion of mine. It's something that's not spoken about very often. We want to continue to rebuild our economy, put this country on a stable footing, and ensure that we have the resources and finances that our schools, hospitals, crime, and all the other services desperately needed. But we can only do that if you play your part and vote Conservative on the 7th of May. To do otherwise, will allow Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP to prop up a Miliband government. And his stance, not only on the NHS and indeed foreign affairs, will be a disaster for this country. So I ask you, think long, think hard. Do we want to continue as we are, or do we want to put it all at risk? Thank you. Andrew Dismore. Time on the 7th of May, we will have a clear choice. The Conservatives who have let you down, or a visible, active Labour MP who you know you can trust to stand up for you, for the community, and for Israel, and against anti Semitism and all its manifestations. Somebody who will work to achieve the Board of Deputies' 10 commitments. The Conservatives have shown they can't be trusted with our NHS, with the GP appointment lottery, long waits at AME and for operations, and the delays in the ambulance service. Conservatives promised to increase the police and handle at the last election, but we now have 69 fewer police officers, that's an 11% cut, 65% cut in the PCSOs, and crime is up year on year as of last month by 1.5%. Emergency calls aren't answered on time. I'd like to tell you a story about one of your neighbours here in Melbourne. <coughs> this uh, lady wrote, emailed me a couple of weeks ago. She says this, I live with my 10-year-old daughter in Mill Hill, London, my three sons did live with me, but over the past 18 months, they've moved out, leaving me with bedroom tax to pay. I work as a domiciliary care worker with a zero hours contract, so if my clients go to hospital, I suffer financially. My daughter's been through a lot too, having undergone a major operation. I need to stay in the area because she's only a year left before secondary school, but I'm struggling to pay the rent on my own. I'm willing to move, but I'm worried because of my rent arrears, they'll evict me. I just want a decent property nearby. I've lived in this area for 20 years. That's the sort of people I'm here to represent and to fight for. We want to deal with these issues of the bedroom tax, of zero hours contracts, of sorting out the NHS, of giving this woman a nice, decent home, secure to live in. So it doesn't have to be like this. We're a great country and we can do better. The Conservatives have promised £25 billion of unfunded promises many are re-announcements of old, of old ideas. Labour's plan is fully costed and the funding has been identified. No extra borrowing required. We will fix the NHS as we've done before, with thousands more nurses, GPs, home care workers and midwives. We'll guarantee GP appointments within 48 hours and on the same day if needed. We will protect the police front line. We will create opportunity for young people and we have a fair plan for the deficit. I believe my 13 years as your MP and three years as Assembly Member show you can rely on me to be hands-on sorting things out for you as I did before, like Holocaust Memorial Day. Get law reform, Holocaust restitution, all private members' bills that I did. Exposing the extremists, I was the first in the field doing that in early 1998. That's why I believe the Jewish News described me as, quote, probably the greatest non-Jewish friend we have ever had in Parliament, close quotes. So I hope you will vote for me on the 7th of May so we can together put Hendon to rights again. Thank you. Now I'm going to hand over to Alistair Hill. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you for organising this uh, debate this evening. It's a pleasure to be given the opportunity to listen to the concerns of the Middle Shore and to discuss the lived-down vision for the United Kingdom and for us in Hendon. And this is our community here in Barnes where I got into politics. The threat of closure and shrinkage facing our libraries, including the one here in Mill Hill, led me to launch my petition and Save Our Libraries campaign, where we've amassed over 9,000 signatures and we will gain a momentum to, to protect this vital local service. Because education and community cohesion are integral for our society. Now, I am standing in this election not just as a Liberal Democrat, but as a new parent and a state school science teacher. 
helping pupils embrace their potential, realize their ambitions, and get on is central to my professional life, my personal life, and my political outlook. A world-class education from cradle to college is essential for instilling an opportunity for all and providing a highly skilled workforce for our prosperous country. Now, over the last five years, we have seen the Liberal Democrat difference in government. Raising the personal allowance, giving £800 pounds back to millions, straight from the Lib Dem manifesto to your wallets. Bringing £2.5 billion pounds of education to the poorest children through our pupil premium. And ensuring pensions ensure earn, uh, increase in earnings or inflation. These are Lib Dem differences for all people across all ages. Now, as well as standing up for fairness and for opportunity, I stand for a truly liberal society. A society where anyone, no matter their ethnic, religious backgrounds, gender or sexuality, are free to practice their customs or express their love without fear, without conformity. A society that embraces multiculturalism because diversity makes us stronger and more outward-looking nation. A society that is positive about immigration because it supports our services, encourages entrepreneurship and strengthens our connections with people across the world. The modern-day threats of climate change, regional instability, and human trafficking knows no national boundary. An international approach is needed now more than ever. This is my view, and this is the view of my party, the Liberal Democrats. Now, in 2010, the UK was on a precipice. With shockwaves from the 2008 crash still being felt, and instability across Europe, stability of the economy was of paramount importance. Aware of this, the Liberal Democrats put the country before the party and formed a coalition. Now, it hasn't been easy, and it hasn't been perfect. But with records of poor unemployment, millions in apprenticeships, legalised same-sex marriage, billions pumped into education for poorest children, doubling our offshore wind energy supply, and the fastest growing economy in the G7, we have made Britain a stronger and more liberal place than ever before. Just a point of order before we move on, can I please kindly request that all mobile phones are switched off so as not to disrupt? Thank you. Now handing over to the UK representative, Raymond Shamash. I stress the first syllable right by Shamash. <laughs> um, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Raymond Shamash. I think I might be the only Hebrew speaking uh, UPIC, uh, UK parliamentary candidate. I was born and educated locally in Barnet. I have Hendon Central Library to thank for giving me a quiet place to study for my A-levels and Barnet to thank for giving me a grant for higher education. I studied dentistry at Leeds University and was active there in union politics. I'm not a career politician and I currently work as a specialist oral surgeon for the NHS in Northamptonshire. I serve in county-wide clinical committees. We have roots locally, my father having served on the anti-aircraft batteries of North London during World War II as the rabbi mentioned, I myself as a soldier, search, serving as a frontline medical officer in the Yom Kippur War, and for those of us who went to Cheda in the land of Goshen. I'm proud of the NHS in which I work, and I'll fight to protect it by promoting a points-based immigration policy. This will allow a continued flow of medical professionals from beyond our shores, while restricting medical tourism, a drain on the NHS budget. Hendon has benefited from immigration, witnessed the Irish pubs, the bagel bakeries, I'm not getting money for saying that, the Indian restaurants, but we believe that the sheer scale and pace of immigration is tearing at our social fabric and unravelling our British culture. Immigration should be a spice enhancing the national dish, but not overwhelm it. UKIP controls on our borders would improve the lives of migrants already here. We are, as a society, tolerant. It's the scale and pace which tears social cohesion. We don't want to pull the drawbridge up. We just want to control who walks across it. I hope in the next hour you will accept that our politics are plain common sense and that the media attacks us in order to shut down the public immigration debate. We want to control our borders. Who here didn't gasp with disbelief when we repeatedly failed to deport Abu Hamza? He costs you and me £2.7 million in welfare, housing and legal fees. And now his sons are in prison for terrorism, fraud and firearms offences, so it's costing us even more. We want to restore our sovereignty by leaving the EU. 
We want to abolish the affront to our freedom by opting out of the European arrest warrant. That's 800 years of freedom since the Magna Carta from arbitrary arrest, abolished at a stroke. Vote UKIP because we are the only party who will fight for a referendum on the EU. Let the British people decide. And finally, Ben Samuel from the Green Party. So, Chavarai, um, we are the champions of the world. Um, isn't it great that we finally had some April showers today? Because um, all those campaigners out there, you know, we were in the sun and we were, you know, delivering leaflets, um, knocking on doors, and um, just all around the country suddenly, you know, whoosh. And climate change is uh, really important, and I, I do thank the Liberal Democrat for actually mentioning it. Uh, with his offshore wind. So, um, the, great. Um, so um, I'd just like to pay a tribute to um, my mother. Um, I, I was campaigning as a baby um, for this. Um, this is a badge with a picture of a baby on it saying, Mummy wants an Arab. And um, wow, well, we were a long time waiting. Um, it, it was really hard fought and it was against anti Semitism, I believe. Um, so, um, the Green MP would um, implement a UK-wide strategy to tackle violence against women, um, including female genital mutilation and trafficking. Um, Article 18 of Human Rights is important to me because I will cut my shrubs, not your rights, by pulling out of um, the European Court of Human Rights um, and London's Green MEP will not introduce pejorative labelling, uh, an issue which um, Jeremy uh, said he would resign over if it appeared in his party's manifesto. Um, the Green Party would require all police officers to have uh, an equality and diversity liaison officer um, who would uh, have a remit to tackle preventative action on um, crimes originating and discrimination against any group um, to kind of treat crimes uh, such as discrimination on the part of race crimes. Um, why, why we march against racism, you know, why I published a piece on brightgrid.org um, in conjunction with Passover and um, International Moment Day. We live in an information age um, where information is power, but who is going to control that information and decide um, you know, what information should be available and to whom? Um, and and how, how, does, you know, how does the law update um, that information age? So um, we would introduce a more satisfactory law on uh, so-called malicious communications made on social media um, that the blanket and crude section 127 of the Communication Act 2003, you know, um, kind of updating. Thanks. Um, so, the um, security for Jewish schools is really important. Um, my, my brother went to MLK and um, we would ensure that the government continues its own, um, position that I would like that was one At this point, I uh, thank you all very much uh, for your opening remarks. I'm going to now pose a question to each of you in no particular order. You will have two minutes in which to respond, after which point again you will hear that bell, and then again kindly finish your sentence. Thereafter, we are going to, of course, open it to the floor. So my first question to our incumbent MP, Dr. Offord, it's been five years since the last general election. Can you tell us three things which you believe you did best for the benefit of the constituents, some of which you may have already touched upon? What might you look to repeat or indeed do differently? Well, we've, I've already mentioned school security, and I think many people in the audience that has been the most important part. And it's certainly an area that I've, uh, I'm very proud of. Um, I also think uh, the funding of the NHS has been very good. 
We often hear that the Conservatives are not the party of the NHS. I think we've proved that we are actually that, that party. And so we will continue to work upon that and we will continue to ensure that we have the resources available. But we can only do that with a strong economy. And the third issue was be turning around the deficit and putting to, to rights the mess that we inherited under the last government. I'm very proud, and I mentioned earlier, that 52,952 people in Hendon have benefited from changes to a taxable allowance. That means money directly into people's pockets that they're able to spend how they want, looking after their family. I'm very proud as well that we've cut unemployment in Hendon. It's down to just under 1,500 people. And of course, we have a record number of apprenticeships of our young people. These are all things I'm very proud of. But most of all for me, what I would like to do is to increase the aspiration of our young people. Education is the most important thing. And I would certainly like to see not only new schools such as Edsheim, and I pay tribute to Adam for establishing Edsheim, uh, but also other school places uh, that we desperately need in this local area. It's been mentioned today about the library. Well, I have to say, as someone who can influence the leader of the council, and indeed the councillors, I can assure you that there won't be any closures to Mill Hill Library. And what I want to see is a great deal of change to make the library more relevant to people locally. And of course, I must mention step-free access in Millhill Broadway, something that I've been campaigning upon and we have not had yet, but certainly some, an area that I wish to address. The next question to Alistair Hill. Nick Clegg was very clear that he doesn't expect there to be an elected prime minister and a, a full majority government. He therefore doesn't expect that he himself, that there will be, um, in, in his own capacity, an, an elected prime minister. But in his anticipation of a hung parliament, he does feel, as he said, he holds the key to a successful coalition. If indeed that does come to be, who would you like to see a coalition formed with and why? Yes, uh, I think Nick Clegg's absolutely right uh, to, to make it quite clear that, uh, that, that uh, I think that we're all thinking and um, know that there wouldn't be a majority uh, party lead in this country come May the 8th. Uh, I think it's very important that we let, uh, that we first of all negotiate with the party who has the most number of seats. I think that's fair because um, ultimately that is the voice of the people of the country. Um, so I would certainly like to, uh, to first approach those, that party that has the largest uh, number of seats and we'll negotiate uh, from there. Um, it's very important, I think, actually, that Liberal Democrats do form part of a coalition. We think we've done very well in ensuring that this coalition has stayed in the centre ground and we will do so again uh, should we form a coalition next time round. We will ensure that the cuts uh, are not uh, flagrant that they would be under the uh, Tories. We will make sure that we will have uh, fairness integrated in that. That's why our uh, personal tax allowance um, policy has been so successful this time. We'll make sure, of course, that our pupil premium will continue. We have made education one of our red lines for negotiation. I think that's just a good thing to do. Education gives us opportunity for everybody. I think it's vital that we make sure that that is properly uh, funded and also increased in line with population increase. Um, so that's certainly what I think we'll do. Uh, if it was a Labour minority, we wouldn't support it if the, if the SNP were involved. We think that they will break up our country. And I think that is not a premise for them to be engaged uh, with leading this country. But like I say, we will let the people decide first and then we'll negotiate according to what happens on May 2nd. Thank you. Andrew Gizmo, we are living in somewhat precarious financial times. On the one hand, we have climbed out of a dismal recession. On the other hand, recent figures point to a financial slowdown in the first three months of this year. The Prime Minister suggested, as has been touched on earlier as well, that this proves we cannot take the economy for granted. So I ask, is now really the time to risk change? Well, I think the starting point is to try and put the record straight about the economy. When we left office, the economy had been growing for three successive quarters and had reached 1% growth, and the trajectory was upwards. The austerity programme introduced by the government choked that off. We had four years of recession, bar one month, which was Bankers' Bonus Month, and that was so, we got so much it distorted the national figures. During the last Labour government, the UK's growth in GDP per capita was higher than every other G6 country. As a percentage of GDP, the UK had the lowest debt of the G7 countries in May 2010 at 78.46%. Uh, 
Now it's 93.14%. It's gone up by 15%. The, the debt now stands at over 75 billion, and this government has borrowed 200 billion more than it said it was going to do. We lost our AAA rated status under George Osborne. Our goods deficit with the EU, EU is now the worst it, since records began. And when we left off, when we uh, were in office, we were able to reduce the national debt between 30 and 38%. It went up, not because of labour spending, it went up because of the worldwide crisis which started in America. That was primarily due, I think, to lack of supervision of the banks as a result of the Big Bang, uh, which deregulated the banks under Mrs Thatcher. And Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner for economics, recognised that what we had done was going to do a great, did a great deal to save in the world economy. So what do I think? I think that if you look at our record, we are promising every pledge properly funded, no more borrowing. We want to deal with some of the worst excesses of austerity. We will balance the books year on year, and we will put money towards reducing deficit, but we want to do it in a way that deals with some of the worst social consequences that we've seen coming from the recession. Ben Samuel, Mummy wants an A roof, but the Green Party policy document does call for a suspension of EU Israel Association agreement. It also calls for a mandatory labeling of meat products, which would, of course, cripple Shrita and kosher meat in this country. So, notwithstanding the A roof, do you endorse your party's policies? Absolutely, absolutely defend, um, you know, personally, I absolutely defend um, the Jewish way of life, as I've said. Um, so it was, it was the other question, do I back my party's policies? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the things that we're talking about, we're not running, we're not running a campaign against Israel, you know. Um, the, the Jewish community themselves have asked me to back human rights, and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm standing up for human rights, and, and other members of my party are free to do so as well. Um, we, you know, if, if I did want to rebel on, on an Israel motion, um, then, then as Hendon MP, I would have a responsibility to do so. I think there's a huge amount of consensus um, in, uh, amongst, amongst the parties and, and in Hendon. And, um, yeah, as for boycotts, um, that's not in our manifesto either. And um, I, don't, I don't back a cultural boycott um, or a, um, what's the other one, a academic... Israel Association Yeah, so, okay, so I haven't read the agreement and that's European policy um, and I don't think it's likely that anytime soon I'm going to be sitting in a ministerial car, okay? Um, so it's, it's an irrelevant, it's honestly, it's an irrelevant question. I think the question that you should be asking is um, about you know, local issues that, that we're campaigning on, that we're actually looking for homes for London, fair wages, clean air, railways in public hands, and action on climate change. The um, EU, um, yeah. Final question to Raymond Shamash. Everybody has a pretty good idea, and you made it abundantly clear as to where UKIP stands on immigration. What is less clear is your position on education. There are a number of faith schools and free schools in this constituency, indeed many of them same gender schools. Where do you stand on such schools, and how might you consider improving education overall? Um, well, where UKIP stands out on education is that they, ask, they, they support grammar schools. That's the big thing that, that is different from our policy to other, other parties' policies. Um, I found grammar schools were um, a real source of up, upward mobility. And um, the, 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 once you got into a grammar school, you got in just on, on, on merit. And then you were, you were guaranteed a, a good, good shot at going to university. In Northern Ireland, where... Um, they kept their grammar schools, their, their record is consistently better 
than, uh, than our record here. The comprehensives, I think most people will agree, were, I don't know if Alice there will agree, were to a certain extent uh, a race to the bottom. The idea was that they, um, there will be a race to the top, but uh, stand, standards have dropped. As far as faith schools go, um, I'm all in favour of faith schools, I'm all in favour of free schools, but this is the problem where immigration has basically distorted, uh, distorted basically a good idea that, that um, instead of having a, a, a faith school and everybody can just uh, <coughs> teach their faith so they can, they can have a, a Catholic ethos or a Jewish ethos, Church of England ethos, um, all of a sudden we have to monitor these schools because, um, because Muslim schools sometimes uh, teach a very fundamental form of, um, of Islam which is basically intolerant. So faith schools have come under, under a cloud um, because, because of this uh, distortion um, uh, to our education system. But uh, UKIP is in, in favour of local decisions, it's in favour of faith schools, it's in favour of free schools and it is in favour of grammar schools. Okay, at this point, we're going to open it up to the floor. Um, in the first instance, a earlier submitted question, I'm going to invite Charlie Sherrard, QC, to please submit this question. I'll ask. The mic will come around. Good evening. Both major parties have been in power during the period of social media. But social media is out of control. What steps are going to be taken to curb Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, uh, homophobic tweets and other social media comments? Raymond, would you like to answer that? Um, I would say that most people agree that online comments are um, the same as written comments and the same as uh, spoken comments and therefore they're subject to the same uh, libel laws um, as anything else and in fact people have sometimes gone after people, after trolls who have uh, um, slandered them online. I don't necessarily feel that one has to change the law every time there is a bad, um, a bad case. Bad, um, hard cases make bad laws. I think the existing uh, uh, libel laws are quite sufficient. Okay. Go ahead. No, Mike. Oh, sorry, by all means, if you want to come in on that, sorry, forgive me one second. No, 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 if you want to retort or rebuttal. Go ahead. You know, I think it's a very serious issue, and you know, I just refer back to um, to my colleague Luciana Berger, when she was subject to the most appalling trolling from um, somebody who's not just anti-Semitic, but also um, quite sexist in their approach. And I do think we've got to do something about this, which I think, first of all, means getting to grips with the companies who seem to be impervious behind the defence of free speech. I'm all in favour of freedom of expression, but that doesn't include the right to shout fire in the theatre nor does it include the right to libel people or harass them or intimidate them. So we have to get behind this into the companies. And I also think there has to be some disclosure of the people who are doing this sort of thing. I'm being subject to trolling at the moment during this election. Um, I believe in freedom of speech, so I don't know anything about it, but it's pretty unpleasant, I can tell you. So that is something we really do have to act on. I don't know if we're going to come to anti-Semitism more generally later, but uh, in, in that case, I'll something else about some of the thoughts I have. But Matthew, everybody talks about taking a hard line on these sort of things. In reality, these companies, Twitter, Facebook, they are behemoths. I mean, is there any reality of that ever becoming something of yes. sorts? I have to say, I completely agree with that. Um, back in last year, I went to Dublin with John Mann as a member of the All-Party Parliamentary Group Against Anti-Semitism. And we have produced a report. When we went to uh, Facebook, they were very good. They said that they were monitoring extremist comment and they would take action immediately when it was raised with them. When we went to Twitter, they said, it's like a conversation you hear walking down the street. Someone makes a comment and that's it, and then you move on. Well, I certainly disagree. Now, as part of the all-party parliamentary group, myself and John Mann and others, we have given to the government recommendations that they do need to bring in a law. They certainly do need to identify people through
through the social media organisations, and we do need to prosecute them in the fullness of law. And, and Andrew's right, Luciana Berg has been subject to some vile abuse, and so is John Mann. He's been subject to terrible threats online by some crazy guy. And a lot of people who troll usually do it under a pseudonym. So we don't, we are not able to prosecute people or use libel laws against them. We do need to change the law, and we need to do it as soon as possible. I once got a death threat, and a silly person put the name and address on it. <laughs> 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 Want to say uh, I, I would like to say, I remember when I was at school and, um, and they first wanted to limit freedom of expression at one time, as you all know, you could go up to Hyde Park and you could say anything you liked. And I remember there was one teacher there, I was at Christ College, which was about 50% Jewish incidentally, and there was one teacher there who refused to sign the petition. And everybody was saying, why did, don't you sign the petition? He said, I think the law is good as it stands. Now, I know that it hurts us when somebody makes reference to our Jewishness or sort of money or noses or anything like that. But I think free speech is more important than that. At the moment, we have uh, the hate speech law, which uh, includes anything insulting speech, offence, causing distress. I think this closes down the, the debate on, on immigration, because as soon as you say anything, then everybody says, aha, this is hate speech. I think freedom, freedom of speech, even if we personally, as a community, occasionally suffer offence, I think is too important. I think apart from, as Andrew said, fire, um, uh, incitement to violence, shouting fire in a crowded theatre, apart from that, anything goes, however painful it is to us. Okay, thank you. Just um, going to take one last comment on this very quickly inside of 30 seconds, Ben, and then we're going to move on to another question. Go ahead. I've been told that my campaign is quite strong online, and um, someone tweeted me on Twitter to um, suggest that I might want to um, support the NHS or something. And his profile picture was abhorrent, in my opinion, and every time I looked at it, it made me sick. Um, so I asked him to take it down, and he did. Certainly, uh, with regards to, to inciting, inciting hatred, inciting uh, violence, um, the law for, for, for if, like what Raymond was saying, if you wouldn't say it to someone's face, and if it's illegal to say it to someone, then of course it should be the same online too. And so I absolutely do support uh, uh, a greater clampdown on people who are, uh, who are uh, making insightful comments. However, I do defend freedom of speech to the hills, and that certainly uh, we shouldn't, um, we should caution against uh, any sort of long-term censorship for fear of, uh, of people making um, comments that are insulting, because that will in itself uh, breed um, a, sort of a distaste. Uh, and if people can't speak and make their freedom, of, make their speak freely, then it is uh, an impact on what society actually stands for. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, please. I'm a member of Anglian Iranian community in the constituency, and uh, you spoke about fundamentalism. Uh, Anglian Iranian community is the largest community in this constituency. As a woman who's lost her husband as a result of Islamic fundamentalists ruling Iran, we believe that the heart cause, that the heart of this ugly phenomenon of fundamentalism beats in Tehran. And unless we get rid of the mullahs in Iraq, there would be no freedom for Iranian people, no stability and peace in region, in Israel, and the wider world. Unfortunately, so what, sorry, time, forgive me, what is the precise question? My question is that uh, if, hypothetically, a big if, of course, if you become an MP, would you support the aspiration of Iranian people for regime change and you support their resistance. And the second question is that if you become an MP, how could you be a member of GLA as well? Would you give up that one? So let's just stick with the first question. Would you support regime change? Uh, well, I'll do the second question first because it's very simple. Uh, there was a year overlap. My preference would not be to continue, but a by-election costs one and a half million pounds. Uh, the pay that you get is abated. I will donate the pay to charity. And in fact, most of the work comes from Henan anyway, because half the people still think I'm the MP. 
uh, as far as Iran is concerned, as far as Iran is concerned, I as far as Iran is concerned, I support non-violent action. I don't think there's any prospect of military action against the Iranian regime. Uh, I think that the Mullah regime is abhorrent, but they, we, the, we're now trying to see if we can, through diplomatic means, bring pressure on them. And uh, I think diplomatic processes are the way we have to deal with them. I do not believe in violent overthrow of, of the regime because I think it would cause more problems than it would solve. But I certainly support the need for regime change in a non violent way. Thank you. Matthew wants to come in on this. There's a couple of points from that. Uh, it's certainly a campaign that I've been involved with, the people of Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty, who many were actually British citizens and have ended up there and have been denied any kind of right to return to this country. But there's, there's a couple of issues that I also want to mention. Firstly, the war in Iraq, one of its unintended consequences was that we weren't able to actually tackle the real problem in the region, and that was Iran. Now, most recently, a deal has been concluded P5 plus one for the Iranian nuclear deal. This is something that I've argued about in, in Parliament, and indeed my last question to the Prime Minister was about this issue. I am very concerned about a nuclear Iran. I believe that there's a very short distance between a civil, civilian nuclear Iran and a military and nuclear Iran. Now we all know what um, Ahmadinejad said, that he wants to wipe Israel off the map. I think, particularly if we have a Labour SNP coalition where they decide that they don't want to renew Trident, it would be a disaster if we had ended up having a nuclear run and we won't be able to defend ourselves or indeed others. Jeffrey, you wanted to ask a question? Thank you, Rabbi. I just wanted to pick up a point that Ben Samuel was trying to deal with the, the, the answer to the question you put to him. The Green Party manifesto calls for suspension of the agreement between the European Union and Israel. That's what it says in black and white. As you probably know, the European Union has agreements with many countries throughout the world. Countries, for example, such as Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Morocco, Sudan, Niger, and every one of these countries has been severely criticized by leading human rights organizations. My question to you, Ben, is how can you support a party which discriminates and picks out only Israel for the suspension of trade between Israel and the European Union and turns a blind eye to all the other regimes and all agree are absolutely appalling and still allows trade to go on between them and the European Union. Israel-EU trade agreement 
really does need UK support. And one of my concerns is if we end up somewhere or other coming out of the EU, our influence in defending that agreement will decline. We know that Israel has come under a lot of pressure from other countries in the EU, not the UK, because they've been very supportive of it. The trade agreement is important because the EU is, the, is Israel's biggest trading partner by a long way, not the United States, which people sometimes think that's high tech, but the ordinary jobs of all the Israelis depend on that trade agreement, which is worth 29 billion pounds, 29 billion euros a year, 35% of Israel's exports. It is really important. And my concern with those who are anti-EU is that they will ultimately, indirectly, if we do withdraw from the EU, put that trade agreement at risk. Okay, thank you. Is, is Dora Wayne in the audience? You submitted a question earlier. I'd like you to ask the question, please. Mr. Dismal, you've already mentioned anti-Semitism, and I'd like to ask a more specific question about it. Various party candidates, party previous members of parliament, and local authority candidates have made anti-Semitic, racist, Islamophobic, and similar comments. In fact, earlier this week, a conservative candidate by the name of Gulzabin Asfar, for a local authority, referenced Labour leader Ed Miliband as al Yahud, Arabic for the Jew, in a very derogatory way. What are the parties doing? to stop members and candidates from making these comments and to remove and reprimand them for these comments beyond naughty naughty from the whip. So, Alistair Hill, can you explain to us please why David Ward is being allowed to stand again? Certainly. Well, when David Ward uh, made his comments a number of years ago, uh, they were unpleasant, certainly. And the, uh, he was suspended uh, well, from, uh, from the party for a number of months. I would have wanted to have seen that be for longer the party suspended him for a couple of months, which was mostly over recess, and I think that was a mistake. I think it should have been for much longer, uh, because he uh, they just, just wasn't good enough. Um, so certainly that's, I wouldn't go like back to my point about freedom of uh, speech though. Whilst I think what he says is, uh, is insulting, um, I wouldn't want to censor just because uh, some people are unnecessarily offended. You have a right, uh, right to, to say things, if you disagree with it, then you have a right to, 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 to disagree with that accordingly. Um, so, whilst I, yes, a number of comments he has made were, uh, were inexcusable, uh, they were dealt with, they should be dealt with more, I do think that he has been through that, uh, and uh, he has been uh, allowed to stand, um, and I do not want to censor him uh, because of, of my support for freedom of speech. So racial incitement is acceptable and honor of freedom of speech provided it doesn't cross, it doesn't turn physical. No, no, I wouldn't say that. He, uh, his, his comments, um, his most recent comments, at least as far as I can remember, are um, I, I did not see as being uh, racially insightful. Um, certainly, uh, certainly were ill judged. I mean, his recent comments, particularly about uh, um, Netanyahu visit Paris, I think he was wrong to say that after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. There's absolutely every right for Netanyahu to be there uh, and to as a, as, a, as a democratic country. So I do disagree with those comments, uh, but I don't think uh, that you should be censored for those comments. There was a hand up over there. Go ahead, please. The, left, the gentleman in the grey. That's it. Yeah. Sorry. We'll come back. Go ahead. Yes. This is a question generally. How can you have on your website they can belong to a terrorist organisation and will be permitted by law to belong to it and still be a Jew in that context? I don't understand it. Sorry, can you explain the question? Go ahead, Ben, very briefly. Yep. There's, there's been a debate about whether my party should have um, sort of short term aims or long term um, policies, which are always our policies and always public. And, you know, once members vote and they decide that we'll introduce such a chapter to our um, policies for a sustainable society um, then then those are, those are those are long term so so basically um, the the membership of a terrorist organization um, such as um, ISIL if they have members um, is obviously already illegal not because being a member of a, list, a prescribed organisation is illegal, but the way that we... I know it is, but it's also illegal because it's, it's supporting killing and murder and abhorrent things, yeah? 
and, and that's why it's illegal, and that's why it's wrong, and that's why we... Um, okay, thank you. Lady in the, with the hand up, in the grey sweater. Yeah, go ahead. No, you. You? Hi, uh, I'm, this morning you probably remember me, Carolyn, the day you knocked on my door. <laughs> 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 because they do not provide enough of affordable housing in the definition of, of, that I would call affordable. 80% of market rent or 80% of market purchase is not affordable to most people in our area. So we need to fix the broken housing market. And there are a number of different issues about that. Uh, what we have to do, I think, first of all, is to give priority to local first-time buyers, which is what we will do. I think it's disgraceful that we have so many of our homes that are being built in Collindale, sold abroad in Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, Singapore, off plan. Londoners cannot compete in that market. You cannot pay for your existing housing in London and, that, and then also put the money up front for a house you're not going to see in two years' time. If you're an investor from Malaysia, you can do that because you're not interested in the property. You're buying a piece of paper which you will know will go up in value. We have to deal with that abuse so that local people have a fair crack of the whip. We have to make sure that we don't reduce social housing, which would be the consequence of the Conservatives' housing policy. Social housing is where rents are actually fixed at a level people can afford. We have to do something about the problems facing people who are renting, because now the number of people who are renting in Barnet have got, has gone up dramatically, renting privately. We need to give them more rights so that they have three-year tenancies, that they don't face rocketing rents all the time, one-year rent increases fixed to the rate of inflation, we have to make sure they're not hit by rip-off uh, charges from estate agents, as happens now. We have to make sure we increase the housing supply for ordinary people, which is what Labour will do. And I think if you look at some of the abuses we've seen in West Hendon, where people were promised their ability to stay in their own, in their own area, and it simply turned out to be a broken promise, where we see leaseholders who are offered compensation below the amount that they, their properties are worth, and more importantly, below the amount they would need to actually get a shared ownership property on that estate is absolutely appalling. And I think that the shared ownership schemes that you talked about is a very unfair one. If you look at what's happened in the shared ownership schemes, for example, in the Olympic Park, they have put restrictions on the sort of charges that you were faced with, which you didn't expect to be faced with. So you can have shared ownership that does work, but it has to be properly controlled by the planning process and making sure, for example, that whilst the mortgage owner basically they say that the rents are not jacked up like that happened to you and that the service charges aren't jacked up because that is very unfair and completely undermines the whole concept of shared ownership which should be a ticket towards getting your own home not a ticket to a nightmare like your experience. Thank you. Thank you. Just very briefly, Raymond Shamash, I don't know this point. I want to come in on this point, go ahead. Um, all the parties are talking about housing and basically how many they're going to build. And they, the, the figure of 100,000 houses a year is banded around. Um, 
it's all a matter of supply and demand. I can't say when people are talking about affordable housing, a one bedroom flat in this area is, is way in excess of, of a quarter of a million pounds. So I can't see where the affordable housing is going. What you need to do is reduce the demand. The, um, a third of Londoners getting housing support are foreign nationals. A quarter of the babies born here, were, their mothers were not born in the UK. Um, and these councils have a statutory duty to house people. Can we maintain the quorum, please? So um, I, I would say that basically we have to reduce the demand. If you want to build 100,000 new houses um, a year, then you can say goodbye to your green belt. It'll be asphalted over all the way to Milton Keynes. Well, I was going to move on, but I think we've just opened up a big can of worms. So I think Matthew wants to come in over here. Let me, let me start with saying, Andrew, I'm not going to take any lessons of a man who lives in a 2.6 million pounds house in Notting Hill. Well, hang on a minute. First of all, I don't have a 2.6 million pounds in Notting Hill. Wish that I did. And secondly, I don't have a big house in the country either. <laughs> either are you? Right, go ahead. Um, I don't live in either, I'm a private renter and I, uh, I suffer the same um, sort of conundrum that many people suffer in this constituency. I'm a teacher, graduate salary, my wife is a medical researcher, she's a graduate salary, we have a daughter nearly two years old, we're paying almost 50% of our rent, uh, of our salary onto rent. It's extremely difficult, it's very challenging for me to live in Millville, uh, despite the fact that I'm a graduate and I provide a service for North London. Um, so I do feel the sympathy. I was looking into shared ownership myself, and a big issue with shared ownership is those um, maintenance fees that they put, that they charge you. They put, drop, drop down the um, the market value, they charge you 80% market value, but they bump it up 20% with these hidden fees with the uh, maintenance, and it's a real off-putting thing for me. With the Liberal Democrats, uh, what we would like to do is introduce a new um, way to get onto the property ladder, um, a rent-to-own scheme. This is whereby you are, you are paying rent, so you are a private renter, but each time you are monthly pay rent, you pay a little bit of equity off. So it helps you to build up a deposit through monthly payments. So over, over time, you will have ownership of your home without having to wait a long, 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 long time to get that deposit. So that's one thing that we would like to do. But I certainly feel your pain, and it's something that does need to be done, especially here. Thank you. Young lady over here at the front. I'll start by saying to... Matthew and to Andrew, thank you both on behalf of the Jewish community for all the work that you have done on our behalf and protecting and against anti-Semitism and also defending Israel. So much more. <laughs> My question is predominantly, although I have two but I won't be greedy, is for you, Raymond. Your party it plays a good game at positioning itself as an alternative to, you know, for middle class people. There'll be a lot of people in this audience who are listening to you know, your party and in some ways you know, some cynics of us could say have been taken in by you know, some, of the, um, some of the promises that you're making and some, I'd say, of the, um, the language that maybe um, interests them. But convince this audience that really you're nothing more than just a marketing strategy as obviously you know, you, uh, you know, you're Jewish identifiably and convince us that you're nothing more than really just a marketing strategy and that uh, your party which there's been a recent poll which said that 40% of UKIP voters wouldn't support a Jewish PM. Okay, and also obviously there's also the recent examples of these. That that was from Queen Mary research, and also uh, on the Guardian just, website. Just keep your question this way. Okay, so convince us that you're nothing more than really just a puppet, and that you know the Jewish community can put their trust in you and your party, which in so many ways has shown itself to have linked to the far right and have you know. Really, and, and also, okay. can we not have heckling? Let the questioner ask you. You know, questions. once you're not beating up all the immigrants on our doorstep, you're not going to turn on the Jews. In short, is UKIP a racist party as it is portrayed to be? <laughs> I've, I've wrestled with this question um, and, uh, and expected it to be asked. My late mother-in-law, Zikron Lebracha, 
was a, in fact a boat person herself at the end of World War II. She was placed in a DP camp in Germany and uh, not, not given right of citizenship there until she was accepted for the USA. Morally, morally, we should probably let them all in. We should let the one billion people in Africa who are desperately poor and living in failed states, we should let them all in so they won't drown. We should, we should in fact, um, give, give them airline tickets and then they wouldn't have to come by boat. The Jews who came in 1945 were tiny remnants of the Holocaust, educated people with Western values who yearned for religious tolerance and democracy. Um, we at the moment have 300,000 people a year coming uh, to this country. David Cameron, he tried, but he didn't manage to keep it down. These people don't share our Judeo-Christian values. And if they're allowed to come here freely, they will eventually permanently change our society and import their anti-democratic, anti-tolerance, anti-freedom of expression and cause our welfare state to collapse under their weight. The moral thing to do is to allow them all to come. But is that the future you really want? The future that I see, if, the, if there's uh, uncontrolled immigration, is a future of Tower Hamlets, where they flew a Palestinian flag over the, over the town hall and where they have vote rigging and, um, and they're, they're definitely against our community. If, I'm, if you worry about our community, then worry about uncontrolled immigration. So I think the answer to your question is possibly less. I'm going to take a question all the way at the back. There's a hand up at the very end. Lady at the back, yes, you're pointing to yourself. Just stand up, the mic is coming to you. My question is for Andrew and for Matthew. Actually, touched uh, briefly. Sorry, Matthew. At the beginning, of being you touched on education. I'd like to know what you both intend to do for many of the mainstream schools, uh, specifically for the special needs children, who are desperately lacking funds to support them at school. Um, also, the special needs children are being pulled out of uh, the units in Barnet, being placed into mainstream, and also the children who are desperately seeking statements but can't get. Uh, finance attached to their statements to support them at school. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, indeed. Um, we discussed the other day about a Jewish uh, SEN school, and uh, one of the issues that we discussed was that it wasn't, wasn't possible to establish one under the free schools legislation. Actually, uh, that's one issue that I would take back if I was re-elected. Uh, I would speak to the Department of Education to try and make that change to allow it to happen. Um, we also spoke about statementing. Um, statementing does happen, but it's, the funding doesn't always come with it. And I think we certainly need to keep pushing the council on that to ensure that they provide statementing. Um, you also mentioned mainstream schooling. It's a hard one, because sometimes people do want their children to be in mainstream school and not be treated differently. I know that David Blunkett said that when he was young, he was very unhappy to be educated at a blind school, and he felt he wasn't part of the mainstream. It's a very difficult situation. I think we need to consider on a case-by-case -case basis. That was the question that being referred to both, so please. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, th I think that uh, part of it is making sure we have the right finances for schools, and we will increase the school's budget all the way from early years to 19 in line with inflation. But I think one of the key issues here is allowing local authorities to open schools. At the moment, they're forbidden to do so. The only schools that are allowed are free schools or academies, and irrespective of whether they're needed or not, or where they're needed, that is what happens. Now, I think that is nonsense, and we must allow local authorities to open schools and create school places where they're needed, uh, and, and that is what we will do. We will end the free school programme. We won't close down those that are already open, of course, they will continue. But that is not the way, I think, that we should go ahead to provide school places. I think we also need to make sure that all teachers in schools are qualified or working towards qualification, which is not the case now. And one of the things that we want to do is to enable teachers to stay in the classroom and develop their skills. At the moment, the career path for teachers is only to go into management. And some teachers are very good teachers, but they don't want to be managers. And one of the things we've specifically said is we will introduce a new grade, a new career path to master teacher, including, for example, a master teacher in special educational needs qualification, because we recognise that SEN is often left out of the equation. Okay, thank you. Stephen Wilson was the chief executive of the United Synagogue, which represents a very strong proportion, if not majority, of Anglo jury. He has a question on Shkita. Thank you, uh, thank you, Rabbi. This is a question for uh, all of the candidates, if time permits. 
Jewish religious slaughter of animals has been a fundamental part of our lives for 3,000 years. What steps would you take to ensure that it is maintained and protected in its current form? Very briefly, I'm going to put that question to each of the candidates. And Ben, since your party supports labeling meat, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I, I think consumers have the right to choose um, what, what they're eating. So if you're going to have labeling, I think the correct um, law would, under European law, would be um, to to say, well, look, this, this meat was um, tried to be electrocuted, but it wiggled out of the way, and it, it, it was killed by a machine without properly being stunned. Or this pig was um, gassed to, to death, um, you know, or this, this milk came from a cow, which, which was protected from TB by the badger car. Okay, that's going to involve a lot of significant labelling. <laughs> Let's just carry straight down the line. Matthew, if you can continue, please. I feel very strongly about animal welfare and always have done. Um, I don't eat meat, not from a moral perspective, I just don't like it. Um, the reason I support Shahid and Halal is not just because I have a lot of Jewish constituents, it's because I don't believe that stunning works. I think there are more misstuns uh, than anything else. And the reason for stunning is not so that the animal doesn't feel any pain, it's actually so the animal is subservient and they can kill more than quicker. Uh, I think the, the recent campaign by uh, the British Veterinary Association shouldn't focus upon uh, labelling or indeed uh, shahid and halal. What they should do is ensure that the animal welfare standards in all welfare, in, in all slaughterhouses, is much better than it is now, and stop picking up on religious communities in this country. attack on Shakita fails to recognise that it is a, is a practice and a custom that is thousands of years old and has been developed uh, by experts for so long that it is uh, actually humane. It is a stun and slaughter at the same time. It's such an uh, efficient uh, way of slaughter. So the whole premise of, uh, of, of trying to ban it because it is somehow, um, somehow uh, against the animal uh, I think is wrong. Uh, the Liberal Democrats and so do I, we stand for um, to people to practice their faith without impediment, without uh, censorship. And I think f uh, the custom of food preparation is so core to so many people and so many faiths. I think it's very important that we protect that uh, because it, it is such an identifiable uh, practice. So certainly I will be backing it all the way and I would not like to see it being attacked uh, from any side. From any people. My wife, who had a yeshiva education, said it's not shechita, it's shechita, so I said it correctly. I think shechita was, in fact, one of the first animal welfare laws, because basically they, they designate how the, um, the animal should, should be killed, the knife should be without, without blemish. I think it's a humane way to kill. When farmers commit suicide, they don't generally fire a bolt through their head, they cut their wrists. I have here a butcher. I have here a butcher in, in, in the front row who's done this personally, and he says, no. <laughs> can, he, can he show us his wrists? <laughs> who, has, who, who, who told me that there are many Miss Sons, and it's, it's a, a, a very uh, inefficient, inhumane way to kill animals. And I want to state that Farage came out quite specifically that he does not support uh, the man. Uh, well, I think this may be the only time I, I, I'll say this tonight, but I agree 100% with what Matthew had to say. Uh, and I'd only add this, look, the labelling thing is not about food labelling, it's a Trojan horse to get rid of Shakita. And we must not go down that route, because if we go down that route, it means the meat becomes too expensive, it just destroys the whole system. We ha I 100% have defended Shakita when I was an MP and on the London Assembly, and will do so if I'm elected as your MP again. Yes. Gentlemen, all the way at the back in the light blue sweater. Um, my question is about Israel, um, and it's particularly to Mr. Dismore. How can you explain? the Labour Party's sudden determination to destroy the good relations they used to enjoy with Zionism, with Zionists, by recognising the state of Palestine even before Palestine has recognised Israel's right to exist. Well, I think I've made no 
message to the fact that I disagree with that, and if I'd been an MP at the time, I would have voted against that motion, to my mind. This is a diplomatic sideshow by the Palestinians who refuse to address the real issues of <coughs> and difficult questions that any solution in the Middle East require. As far as I'm concerned, um, the question of recognition of Palestine has to come as part of the negotiating process at the appropriate stage, and unless and until Israel recognises Palestine, any such diplomatic moves don't amount to hill of beans. But I think there's a wider question which relates to Labour's approach to Israel. And I, and I think the reason, which is what you're searching for, is this, that at the last election, quite a few of us who are not Jewish but pro-Israel lost our seats. So that slightly shifted the balance within the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, towards the sort of positions that you've identified. And I think that one of the real problems we've got is to try and make sure that Israel does not become a political football between the two main parties. We get things back with even kid. And to do that, we have to reassert the influence of pro-Israeli Labour MPs within the Parliamentary Labour Party, as we had before, and get that position back on an even keel. Uh, I mean, I can talk, I, I'm not sure I've got time to talk about some of the other issues that have arisen, um, but I'm happy to do that if we, if we can. All I'd say is look at Ed Miliband's video on the Board of Deputies uh, website, which is posted today, and I think that we will find some reassurance there. Is there anyone else who wants to come in with a question on this same subject? Gentleman at the back, yeah. Right there. Oh, Jason, this side. Um, good evening. I, I think it's clear to a lot of people here that both uh, Matthew and Andrew Dismal are good friends of the Jewish people, good friends of the community, and very good friends of Israel. And with respect to the other candidates, there's probably only going to be one of you two, which will be the future Member of Parliament from May the 8th. Therefore, it seems quite clear that if Matthew is elected and David Cameron becomes Prime Minister, we know where he stands when Israel has to defend themselves from Hamas. But if Andrew Dismal becomes the Member of Parliament and Ed Miliband becomes Prime Minister, then where does Israel stand when it's attacked again by Hamas and Ed Miliband suggests that Israel has no right to defend themselves and certainly not going to Gaza. I know the question was addressed in that direction, but I'm going to ask Matthew in the first instance for comment on that. Well, I have to say, I, no one doubts Andrew's commitment on Israel and commitment to the Israeli state. There's no doubt about that. And certainly no one questions mine. But where we do question is Ed Miliband's. Now, David Cameron's made it very clear that he certainly support Israel's right to defend itself, and it did so at the time of the Gaza incursion. And we will continue to do that. I think uh, also, if there was a, 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 a Liberal, uh, Labour Party, SNP coalition, we know the views of Nicola Sturgeon upon Israel as well. <laughs> I think the country would be at great risk. We certainly know who our friends are in times of need, and I think we displayed that. David, David Cameron's made his commitment to Israel absolute. But what I would say, it's not about Andrew's commitment to Israel, it's not even about mine. It is about the leader of the parties. And David Cameron has proved time and time again he is a true friend of Israel, and Ed Miliband has not. Briefly, briefly, on the Palestinian uh, statehood question, I spoke in that debate, and I was heckled from all sides. And I was very happy to be heckled from all sides, because I said what I believe to be true. Any recognition undermines the peace process and the Oslo Accords. It's as simple as that. But the worst part of this was that it was a backbench motion. So government ministers will not vote upon it, because it was for backbenchers to decide. Ed Miliband put a three-line whip on all his MPs to vote in favour of it. And some of us, and I'm very proud to say Mike Freer and I went through the no lobby, and Mike resigned as a PPS, for actually defending the government's uh, own policy. But that was certainly the right thing to do, and I will certainly continue to do that. So Andrew, I, everybody here acknowledges the fact that you personally have been an exceptional supporter of Israel, for which we have always been incredibly grateful. But how do you allay the fears of the community with regard to your leader? Well, can I just deal with this? point that Matthew's raised a couple of times so far, there is not going to be a coalition between the Labour Party and the SNP. And, um, if we get 
get time to debate it, I'm happy to go into that at greater length, but I'm not going to let that, let that rest, because we made that absolutely clear. I mean, as, far as, as far as Israel is concerned, I think one needs to draw a distinction between criticism of certain actions of the Israeli government and <coughs> criticism of Israel's right to exist. The two are, the two are, are different. And I think that if you look at what happened over Gaza, for example, I disagreed with my party's position. I wrote publicly about that. Um, I, I, I wrote publicly about that. I, some of the things I wrote, for example, for the Evening Standard were printed, but I, I, I think I'm pretty well clearly on record about that. I, I, one of the things I, have to, I think we have to recognise is that what Edmund Obama was saying at that time was echoed by a lot of the Jewish community in this country. And I don't think anyone would accuse those people of being anti-Israel. They had a different perspective of what was going, what was going on. What Edmund Ibn was, was saying was that we had to stop the fighting. We had to stop what, what uh, the, uh, the Palestinians were, were, were doing, or rather Hamas, rather than Palestinians, although they're not quite the same, they're always the same thing, were, were doing. But, in, but for a short-term security gain, Israel was going to create much longer-term problems for itself when it comes to both security and in terms of getting a settlement. So what has happened is Hamas has been strengthened on the West Bank as against Fatah, which is a problem. Hamas has rearmed, which is a problem. Hamas uh, has got a whole new generation of terrorists. We see them marching up and down and parading on the television, which is what has happened. Are we saying that every year or two years, Israel is gonna go and blow up Gaza again? Because that is not the way to try and get a solution. We have to try and move things forward. Now, I think that when people get in government, one starts to see a, a different perspective. And some of you may remember seeing these, this headline in the Jewish Chronicle soon after the last election, fury over Cameron's remarks on Gaza, when he called Gaza a prison camp and attacked the, Isra and attacked the Israelis for trying to stop that, sm that smuggling of arms from Turkey into Gaza. He's changed his position, I agree, and I think Ed will also adjust his position Okay, very briefly, because I don't want to get too stuck on this same subject, if I just move away from it, but Raymond, very briefly. I think this. Ed Miliband's promise not to go into coalition with the SNP will go the same way as uh, Nick Clegg's promise on tuition fees. <laughs> the, the, the SNP are going to have maybe about 50 seats. Uh, that, that's what they're predicting. It's going to be a tsunami, they say, in, in Scotland. The SNP is really close to, um, they've sold their soul to the, uh, to the sort of Scottish uh, Islamic Foundation. So they secured £400,000 of t Scottish taxpayers' money was given to, to launch Salam Scotland. The event never took place. There was no audit trail. There was no accountability. The money just disappeared. There was a person called Abdul Raouf who was um, who was in prison for benefit fraud, um, for, and he was on trial again for another eighty thousand pounds. And Nicola Sturgeon intervened personally to stop him get a cust to stop him getting a custodial sentence. They, they've sold their soul for whatever reason. Okay, let us move away from the Israel question. Unless there's a question from the young lady over here, Caroline. Question um, is mostly for Raymond. Um, I've worked in immigration for nearly 10 years, um, and I don't think I'm alone in saying that as a Jew, I'm very uncomfortable seeing another Jew standing for UKIP. Um, What's the question? Please? My question is: UKIP have been very clear about how they they deal with the pro the problem of immigration in terms of Europe. Let's just leave Europe, and it will all be fine. But how are you planning to deal with all those immigrants who are not from Europe and those in particular who are seeking refuge here, like lots and lots of Jews have needed to in the past? Um, I, I work where I work in Northamptonshire with um, a, a very able Indian doctor, a very able Polish uh, 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 dentist. And um, the UKIP policy is going to be like the Australian policy, which is point-based. Um, when, I, when I met our rabbi today, I jokingly said that, uh, that he was an immigrant, but, but in fact, on a points-based policy, we would give special points for people who kept all the mid spot. So uh, we, would, we would certainly encourage, uh, encourage rabbis. 
But um, basically, <laughs> imams, as long as they disavowed violence um, and they were needed, then I think we should be we should allow imams to come. The, um, a a point-space policy would basically we would choose the people we wanted to let in. We um, we if we at the moment if you've got an unskilled Bul Bulgarian, he can immigrate, but an Australian heart surgeon can't. The, uh, the, 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 the situation at the moment is, um, is, is all skewed. Refugees, nobody has a problem. In the at the moment, there's what's called, you'll hear about it soon, a common European asylum policy. No, there isn't. There, um, it's not, it's not uh, there's, there's huge differences of opinion about it. That's the way it's going. And they're, 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 they say that they're going to um, accept refugees who are uh, victims of war, fair enough. Victims of persecution, fair enough. But now they're talking about people who suffer from poverty. That's, that's the whole population of Africa. So we basically want a point... Okay, let's move on. Let's ask Alistair. Alistair wants to come into the comment on this, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I've been very concerned over the number of the recent years about how uh, immigration has been framed so negatively. Immigration uh, d does a lot of positive things for this country. Uh, many people, in fact a large number of people of our NHS, uh, are, are immigrants and they come here and they want to work with their skills and to provide for society and then they settle down, they pay their taxes and they are welcome. I think that's very important. Um, but the negative rhetoric that we have had, not just in the United Kingdom, but across Europe with regards to immigration, I think has really stalled our efforts to ensure that the safety of the people who are seeking refuge in Europe, like across the Mediterranean, we have let them down because we haven't talked about it, because it's almost a wrong thing, it almost seems like it's going against national uh, opinion to talk about immigration and the idea of asylum and refugee positively. And I think in order to deal with this, we need to be more internationalist and less insular with the way things are going. We need to make sure that our, our, um, our foreign aid is kept at a sufficient level so that we are able to solve problems in the countries before they decide to leave. We need to make sure that, uh, that we do have proper post-conflict resolutions in the Maghreb to make sure that the, our borders are stable so people don't get uh, trafficked across those borders. And we need to be strong within the European Union so that we can actually work together in order to deal with what is a human tragedy. This is beyond politics. We need to really work together uh, on this field to, to help those who are struggling across the Mediterranean. Thank you. Lady over here. I don't trust Labour, and I don't think you give her our yet capable of running our country. None of the parties can give any improvements without money. So my question to Matthew Offord is, in order to continue the Conservative success, where will the money come from exactly to make the improvements that you have mentioned? Okay, I can certainly tell you. By continuing with our strong economy through tax revenue, we're having a thousand jobs a day being created under the coalition, and certainly we've had more start-up businesses in the area. We've had about 22,000. That's where we get the money from, through tax revenue. Um, I think we can the fact is that the Conservatives have made 25 billion pounds worth of uncosted, un un unfinanced promises. And Matthew may say that more jobs have been created, and I don't dispute that, but they're low paid, zero, a lot of zero hours, a lot of part-time, and if I was wrong about that, why hasn't the income tax take gone up dramatically? Because it hasn't. Yes, we do have to have more people in work, but we have to have people in decent jobs, earning decent wages and paying income tax. Because that shows that they have made huge progress personally, economically. And that's not what's happened in this government. Matthew says that's incorrect. Trot out the line that everyone's on a zero hour contract. And when you look at the figures, actually, it's about one person in 50 is on a zero hour contract. And for some people, a zero hour contract works. Where we've legislated, and what we don't like, is exclusive zero hour contracts where you're not allowed to work for anyone else. But anyone who's a student, perhaps someone who has childcare issues, uh, that a zero hour contract will work for them. So it's just a myth to say all these jobs are low paid cleaners and, and they're all women. 
Actually, the jobs in, the, in this country have increased a great deal. Well, let, let me just say something about Zero's contracts, because it is right that we ban uh, exclusive contracts, but that's not the end of the story. Let me tell you a story. On Saturdays, I have my own little treat. Um, I go to a cafe in one of, a well-known restaurant chain, not in the constituency, for breakfast. I go look somewhere else, so I'm not recognised and have a quiet breakfast in my life. And while I was there, I overheard a conversation between the restaurant manager and one of the waiters. And it went something like this. The restaurant manager, oh, uh, would you like to have, a, have the day off? And the man said, well, not really. And the restaurant manager said, well, I think you should take the day off and, uh, and go home uh, because we don't need you. And I was listening to this, they suddenly clicked. This guy had turned up for work, on time, changed into his uniform, half an hour into his shift, there wasn't as much business as there normally was in the restaurant, and he was being sent home without getting paid, because he was on a zero-hours contract. That is the sort of abuses that these sort of things generate. And we have to really get to grips with zero-hours contracts like that. <laughs> How, how Andrew Dismal knows the guy was on a zero hour contract. But uh, as I said, as I said, um, the number of people have increased. But I think, uh, particularly, uh, youth unemployment uh, raised 45% under Labour, and we have introduced the apprenticeship programme, and that has certainly helped many more people. But uh, what I'm most keen on is actually making work pay by increasing the taxable allowance, meaning that people work and they take more of their own money home. So an additional 1.9 million people across the country are in work. They actually, they actually provide for their families. They have a reason. And we've done that through the introduction of the benefit cap and through changes in the taxable allowance. And that is a very positive step. But for people to talk down the economy, I think is not only dangerous, but it's also a very wrong thing to do as a politician. I'm going to let Alistair have a quick 30 seconds on this. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, um, the, the Tories say uh, that they have their long-term economic plan. That's the mantra they say. They do indeed that well put it in their first. But of course, the reason why that uh, our economy has improved greatly, that we have got more apprenticeships, that we have got the personal allowance increase, is because the Lib Dems have been there in government too. If you want to stay on this long term economic plan, you need to stay solidly in the centre ground with the Liberal Democrats in government as well, because it's through our ideas of fairness that have ensured that people can uh, survive through what has been hard times. And it has contributed to the, uh, the higher skilled work that's come out through our apprenticeship scheme. So uh, I'll be a danger of the Tories going alone, where they'll cut too deeply, too capacity, uh, too quickly, which will possibly damage uh, our, our improvements in the long term. We need a more central view, which is why the Liberal Democrats uh, play, uh, will play, hopefully, a uh, key role in uh, economic policy. Thank which you. Is We've all just been talking a lot about income tax and um, people paying their taxes, but no one seems to be mentioning corporation tax. We used to have a situation in this country where corporations pay about 60% of the, of, uh, contributed 60% of the tax revenue in this country and individuals contributed about 40%. It's now about 70% from individuals and about 30% from corporations. And I'd like to understand what you would do to uh, make sure corporations pay their fair share of tax, including the likes of Starbucks and Amazon and people like that who clearly don't contribute enough to the country. Okay, thank you. For anyone who will want to comment on that, let's keep that to 30 seconds. Ben, you want to say something? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was door knocking, actually, and that actually came up um, as part of my economic narrative, and that's the part that resonated the most. So many people have written to me about tackling the tax loopholes, um, and um, I think... I think that like there's a sense that the tax system is unfair and it needs to be kind of fundamentally tightened, you know. Um, so so yeah, um, I'm I'm all for um, companies paying their share. Their share. Well, I, I believe we've certainly done more than any other government. I think I believe the Labour Party turned a blind eye because they didn't believe in the building the bus anymore. But the measures that we've taken have actually achieved an £85 billion increase in the amount of revenue we get from businesses. We've also introduced the income tax register uh, of transparency with other countries. So we know that if a, country, a, a company is not paying income tax in this country, or corporation tax rather, then they have to be paying it somewhere. And we have co um, collaborated with other countries to find out where money is being paid tax. And we will continue to do that. Thank you, Jeff. I think certainly in this government we have been closing loopholes, we have been clamping down, we've, had, uh, we've increased the number of people employed in HMRC to look at this specifically. 
and I think uh, we have got we have got uh, billions of pounds back. But it's not enough. It's just a start. And I, I would echo what Matthew has said uh, that we do need to do more. Uh, and certainly with the, the 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 start that we have done, if we continue on that trajectory, we should be receiving a much more fairer uh, income through uh, missed corporation tax and missed uh, corporation income. Now, Ed Miliband seems to revel in being anti-business. Rent controls against zero-hour contracts, freezing energy. He seems to forget it's the wealth which pays for our NHS. Though I, I do agree that, that uh, the companies like Starbucks and Google, which basically declare, uh, 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 declare their tax in another jurisdiction, the law should be changed so that they get taxed fairly in this country. The Conservatives are planning a 1% cut in corporation tax. That only benefits big business. We will cancel that and use the money instead to provide business rate relief for the small businesses, 1.5 million small businesses who do not who need a helping hand, including, for example, in Barnet, where the council has just withdrawn the discretionary rate relief for small businesses. We will make that funded centrally and compulsory. So small businesses will benefit. Big businesses will end up paying a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start winding down and we're going to take only a couple more questions, but in the earlier submitted question by Anna Petruk. This is for all the candidates. Was Ed Miliband's interview by Russell Brand Car Crash TV or an election game changer? Too many of the candidates want to come in on that? Certainly, um, I, I do appreciate uh, the idea of engaging with as many voters as possible, as many different people from the demographic. Uh, certainly, people who would follow Russell Brand's YouTube channel are probably the least likely people who to vote, because that's what Russell Brand said himself. Um, nevertheless, I think it's important that we do engage uh, with people who have been put off by politics. Whether or not the, per the king of being put off by politics is the man to put that through, I'm not too sure. Um, but I do support any, any way of engagement with people. For example, my play has appeared in the last leg a couple of times. I do think that has been a way to engage with people who are not normally turned on by politics. So I, I do support that idea. Uh, but uh, like I say, I don't know what to confess here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen it. I heard some snippets on the radio. Uh, I think it is important that party leaders go out of their way, uh, as uh, I sort of said, to try and engage with audiences who would not normally be engaged in politics. I think it's regrettable that Russell Brand thinks that the way to change society is to have a, a revolution rather than through the ballot box. Uh, a ballot, the ballot box is the way to change things and as Ed said on the show, you know, do not expect on day one a complete transformation to, uh, of the world. It won't happen that way. Change takes time and I think that those who are impatient like Russell Brand and think you can just throw everything up in the air, have a revolution and the world will be wonderful afterwards. Uh, in exam. Thank you. Um, well, um, start by saying that Russell Brand is an idiot. <laughs> this is a man that spouts nonsense in his book and spouts nonsense and is a complete hypocrite as he takes advantage of tax loopholes in the film industry. But I always think you can judge a person by their friends, and if Ed Miliband's got a new friend, it's so be it. <laughs> Comment on this, please go ahead. Yeah. I would say Russell Brands half read a lot of books and half understood them. His main claim to fame is his recovered, is a recovered heroin addict. I seem to recollect that people used to court Jimmy Savile because he used to engage people that the uh, perceptions of society that other other people didn't reach. And uh, you know where that went. On that note, right. Next question, taking it from the audience over here. Yes, gentleman in the grey jacket. Uh, La Labour gave us the boozer, uh, by which I mean the continental style drinking, and the continental style drinking, and the Conservatives have given us the betting shop, and in the area in which I live, we have seven betting shops, and they are one Ladbrook, no, one we don't, we don't, we don't need one Bet Fred, Excuse me. Just two, straight, straight to the question. Straight to the question. I will go to the question. No, straight to the question. Straight to the question, we're going to have to move on to somebody else. Yes, go ahead. Lady standing up over there at the far back. I'm sorry. The question is, can we expect more, please, from the next government? That is the question. 
more what? There are rules. You play by the rules or you get cut off. City Hall, we produced a report about this, drawing attention to this plethora of betting shops uh, and, and other undesirable operations. What we say in Labour is we will reform the public law to give local authorities the power to control these betting shops and indeed other pawnbrokers and so on who are seem to breed along the high street. Just look at Hendon Central to see what's happened there. We have to have powers for local authorities, strong lo powers for local authorities to say Enough is enough. We will not license any more of these premises. Okay, go ahead. Lady, yeah, no, no, just further back, right there, holding her hand up in the air. That's it. Hi, um, I've got two children who are under two years old and I'm a primary school teacher. When I return to work, it's going to cost me more in childcare than I actually will earn. And I just wondered if anyone's going to help me with that. I sympathise with that greatly uh, as a teacher and having a child who's just turned two, it is extremely difficult. Um, in what the Liberal Democrats uh, have done in coalition, we have introduced 15 hours free childcare for three to four year olds. We would like to extend that uh, to 20 hours and extend that down to two year olds as well. I think it's very important that we do have uh, that, that in place. And also, it's important that we have a shift in, in how we view childcare. From two to four, we talk a lot about childcare, but actually, it's early years education. And we need people there to actually support the development of children at that age, which is why we would like to have qualified uh, support teachers down to that age. We would like to have our people premium put down to that age too to help people uh, from disadvantaged communities. And other things that we've done, we've induced tax-free uh, um, childcare vouchers, which help out a little bit each month. We would like to extend that a bit more to help you. Because ultimately, we want people to go back to work if they want to. Because then uh, there's uh, increased self-esteem. Uh, and it's also you contributing to the economy as well. So certainly, uh, we've got plans there, uh, we've got a good record that we've done this in the coalition, and uh, if we are in part of government, we'll extend that further. Gentlemen. <laughs> Gentlemen over there. Yes. Uh, right down. He's got his hand up. Um, on the subject of uh, bookies, I actually, uh, in the national interest, I popped into the bookie on the way here to check the odds on the elections. And uh, I, as a supporter of yours in the last election, Mr. Dismal, I want to ask you, because um, I was looking at the odds, and the odds on the Conservatives being the main, the leading party, are about four to one on, and Labour's about three to one against. And looking at Newsnight last night, you're projected to get 270 seats and the Conservatives 280 seats. And what I want to ask you is, if that's right, and you fall about 50 seats short of a majority, and the Scottish Nationalists get 50 seats themselves, you don't like me talking about the Scottish Nationalists because you've been wincing every time they're mentioned. But in the interest of the Labour Party, which I supported last time, and the national interest, if, in fact, you get 270 seats, would it not be perhaps in your interest and the national interest for you to take a step back and be the party in waiting, the next government in waiting, rather than perhaps be held to ransom by the Scottish nationalists? Okay. Well, um, I, I, I don't think you held much by the bookies' odds because in 1997 I was five to one against. They no one put any money on me, including it happens the Conservative MP who I defeated. Uh, made a packet, so uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold too much on the odds uh, at the bookies. Um, as far as the more serious question is concerned, the SNP, we made it absolutely clear we will not have a coalition of the SNP. They are our political opponents in Scotland. They've never had a good word to say about the Labour Party, and we will, we will not have a deal with them. Now, if we end up being the largest, we'll have to see who's the largest party anyway, and whether there are arrangements that can be made with the other pro-union parties, like the Liberals or like the uh, Ulster Unionists, then I think that may be, may be something we could do. But we will not have a deal with the SNP. 
If we turn out to be the largest party, as we did in 1974, we may end up forming, forming a minority government, and then the SNP will have to decide whether they want to put their money where their mouth is and vote for a Labour budget and vote for a Labour Queen speech, or whether they want to trigger another election and risk the Conservatives coming back. That's a matter for the SNP. We are not going to do a deal with them. And one of the things I'm really concerned about is the way the red stick from the Conservative Party is undermining the union. It's putting English people against the Scots, the Scots people against the English, and that ultimately is the road to breaking up the United Kingdom. I think that rhetoric is very dangerous indeed. Thank you. Now, can you comment on a quick point, and then we'll take the final two questions. Go ahead. I remember answering questions in, in this synagogue last election and someone said what policies will you jettison when you have a coalition and I remember saying there won't be a coalition it will not happen none of us actually know but what we do know from polling is that uh, Labour is predicted to be wiped out by the SNP and we all know Nicola Sturgeon is bending over backwards to uh, get Ed, Mil Ed Miliband into 10 Downing Street now Andrew's saying that uh, there won't be any deal and he won't accept any help from them of confidence or supply or anything for the SNP to prop up the Labour government. Well, I just say, I think Ed Miliband will, because we shouldn't forget, not only was this guy the person that knifed his own brother in the back, I'm sure he knifed the country in the back. Okay, that's enough. We're going to take two final questions. We're going to discuss with the audience. Go ahead. You've got 30 seconds. of three brothers. I used to do judo with my younger brother and I can tell you he never laid up on me and I would never expected him to. We have a contest between two people offering a different perspective to the Labour Party. Ed Miliband won a fair contest and that is why he's our leader. It's nothing to do with knifing anybody in the back. We okay. do not have primogeniture just because the oldest doesn't mean to say you inherit the earth. Thank you. Uh, there was a question. Go ahead, Michelle. I'd be interested to hear about your um, transport policies with um, respect specifically to the, <coughs> the way the rail franchises are run. Um, I think we're very much shortchanged in Mill Hill. Um, <coughs> with Goga now and previously with Tensley, we've never had a good service. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to expound on that from an earlier submitted question where somebody commented that he works at Heathrow and the journey takes him about an hour and costs him 22 pounds. Um, if he goes by car, then it'll actually take him two hours and cost him, sorry, cost him uh, a big apartment. If he goes by car, it takes him an hour and costs him 22 pounds. If he takes public transport, it costs him 58 pounds and takes him two hours. He wants to know, how are you going to improve public transport to overtake driving by car? And that's, I think, in line with what Michelle was asking. Thank you. Can we get some quick 30-second responses on that? Go ahead. Give us a response. Um, yeah, so um, we, we want to cut rail fares by 10% by totally <coughs> taking the railways back into public ownership. What that means for you is under TfL. Uh, currently, it's run by a private company. Currently, we're hearing fudge from certain other parties, and, and, and I'm, I'm confused as to what, what their policy is. But I'm, I've been very, very clear um, that. I, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I've been very, very clear that um, we want to cut rail fares by 10% and, and bus fares by 7% the day after the election. Okay, Matthew? Well, I think many of us are confused by other parties' uh, position on many issues. <laughs> no, Thameslink and the Gobia franchise, it's not working. It's as simple as that. The government have invested £6.5 billion in the Thameslink programme and our, our a transport provider is letting us down. So what I want to see is Thameslink uh, working properly. Govia, we will take the contract back if they don't uh, undertake the contract properly. I want to see them working with uh, Crossroad so people can get across the, the, the capital, like the gentleman who wants to go to Heathrow. But I make it very clear, I'm very unhappy with their performance. Uh, absolutely. I think we need to have a, a greater powers in taking back uh, contracts which, have been, uh, which we have been let down by. Um, uh, I think that's very important. I think with regards to, uh, to in, a, in this inner city rail that we have, such as terms like it does need to be bring, brought into the TFL system through the overground or through something else. Because I think that's extremely important because not only does it link better with transport, but the fares will be, uh, be the same. 
I think that's very important too. Uh, Matthew talks about greater transport across well. That's something that Mill Hill needs especially. We need greater orbital transport in this part of London. It takes me a long time to get to work. It's just Harringay. We had a, a, tra a transit system which was orbital at this zone. I think would be extremely important. Thank you. Um, First of all, UKIP are against HS2 and in, and in favour of using the, all the billions that it's going to cost into going into the rail services. Um, as far as um, is my, my, green, my green colleague over there is talking about public ownership, even Andrew's not a clause for man, nationalisation man. I didn't know people actually wanted to re, uh, to re nationalise the railways. Um, everybody always talks how the everything's uh, knocks everything. The NHS is in crisis, the, the, the trains are terrible. They can always be improved, but they're not terrible and we're not in crisis. Thank you. Okay. Try taking one. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Matthew welcomed Gurview taking over. Who would have thought it could get worse than FCC? Our position is absolutely clear about this. We want to review the franchising system. We want to allow public sector operators to compete on equal terms before taking over these lines. Every political party at City Hall, Boris Johnson, the, the only thing I agree with Boris Johnson on is this, the Thames Link Line should have come within Transport for London. It would have been transformed in the same way that the overground trans was transformed from being the worst performing, least popular line in the country to one of the best performing and most popular lines in the country. The only person who disagrees with that is the person on the other end of this table. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask you each, I'm going to ask you each to take at a maximum 60 seconds, after which point your mic will get cut. 60 seconds to sum up and tell us why you feel you should be the next MP for our constituency. And I'll start with Andrew. Uh, well, I mentioned at the beginning the case of that lady who is one of your neighbours in the Middle East. And I think that what this, this job is about is actually looking at real people, real people's problems, and addressing them. It's all well for us to talk high, in highfalutin ways about great policy. But I want to do something for that lady. I want to make sure she gets an affordable, decent home. I want to make sure her child gets the best possible health care because she's worried about the child's future. I want to make sure that she has a secure job, not dependent on a zero-hours contract and an income which varies and fluctuates. I want to make sure she is not hit by the bedroom tax and forced into arrears that are no fault of her own. Those are all things that I want to be able to achieve on her behalf and to become MP for Hedden so I can do that. Thank you. Matthew? A simple choice of the next election. Whether you vote for the Conservatives, who have undertaken to repair the economy, have certainly improved the employment chances of many local people, with more than 1,500 people gaining a job, and certainly more people being able to start to actually engage in society. That's something that they was denied un until the government was elected. But for me personally, I've always made a commitment that I live in the constituency, I don't claim for food, and I don't undertake gesture politics. I've always said what I believe. Sometimes people don't like that. Sometimes the whips don't like that. But I've always put the constituency first and I always intend to do so. So the choice next week is clear. When we go back to the Labour Party under Ed Balls and Ed Miliband and we risk the chaos and confusion of their policies, or we stick with the long-term economic plan that we have, that is gaining prosperity, that is improving jobs, which is keeping inflation low, and most importantly, we may ensure we have a better future for everyone. Raymond. Yeah. Labour says they got it wrong on, in, on the economy. They say they got it wrong on immigration. It beggars belief that after five years, with the same team in place, they expect us to trust them again. The Conservatives are talking tough on immigration and the EU, but we have no credible hope of renegotiation. We were outvoted 26 to 2 on the Junkers vote, which was basically about free movement of people. The Conservatives support the accession of Turkey, 80 million people. You, you vote UKIP, you get UKIP. Vote for us and get your country back. Alistair. I work at the coal face of, of public life as a teacher 
and I think that's the sort of experience that uh, is needed in Parliament. Um, I will bring into Parliament uh, the wealth of experience uh, from working with the policies that are enacted by government. Um, I will also um, be, uh, be, be there to support um, the development of our public services. Now, when the Liberal Democrats uh, made the tough choice to join the coalition, uh, we managed to get over 75% of our manifesto in place, despite only having 8% of our MPs. The Liberal Democrats work hard to, and fight hard with who they are with, and the Liberal Democrats are needed in the next government in order to anchor us into the centre ground, so we stay on the correct path of prosperity, ensuring that education uh, is, is maintained, and so that opportunity is available for all. And final word to Ben Samuel. So, yeah, I... <laughs> look, guys, you're taking up my time. So, <laughs> policy of defence and defence. Um, the, um, we've heard a lot of personal attacks tonight, um, not, just, not just at the Green Party and, you know, our um, leadership, but also Russell Brand against Dead Miliband. But I think what we really want to be debating is policies. Things like the first contact that my parents had with um, Matthew Offord when he was a counsellor, um, with relation to the Fumates collection service. Um, so I, I just think that we really need to um, tackle the shortage of council homes by building half a million in the next year. And we need to sort our economy by putting money in people's pockets, have benefits for all, a living wage, um, fair taxes. And um, to answer the lady's question about um, the, the kids, yeah, free childcare, um, starting education at seven, but before that having play, having playing fields. Yeah. Um, and... Thank you. All right, just very quickly for all those floating voters that might now have a more definitive stance or anybody else whose position might have changed here tonight, please raise your hand. All right, interesting. Okay, can I just thank you gentlemen very, very much for coming along here tonight. It is greatly appreciated for sharing with us and we all wish you the best of luck on Holy Day. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen.